All right. Welcome back. Happy engineer. I'm here with Robert Mack. Robert, thanks so much for making time, your generosity to be here on the show today. Welcome. My pleasure. I'm excited to be here. So preparing to chat with you was one of those things. And we just said it before we hit record today. It was like, wow, this is my brother in arms when it comes to the message and the mantra of what OWACO stands for and the happy engineer stands for. But there was something that surprised me when I was digging into your life that I'd love to get some feedback on from you. So you were a celebrity love coach on Famously Single on the E! Entertainment Network. And I, I was like, okay, this is, it does, one of these is not like the other. And I thought, okay, what was that all about, man? What was it like to be a celebrity love coach? It was great. I mean, it was great in a way that I didn't expect it to be great. You know, I um, had spent about 10 years prior to the work that I do now in positive psychology, really doing entertainment work, which mostly for me meant being unemployed often, <laughs> right? Okay. So I worked as a model and as an actor. And so at some point in time, after I started my private practice in psychology, I was really pitching some TV shows because I thought, wow, we've got this incredibly powerful tool of television that we could use for much more positive, constructive ends. And it's not being done. So, and then I got to a place where I sort of put that on the shelf and said, you know, I'm not getting a lot of bites here. I'm going to put the TV pitches aside. I'm just going to focus on the bread and butter, which is helping people live happier lives. And lo and behold, like most things in life, you surrender, you let go. And a few years later, I got a phone call. They said, hey, we're doing a TV show and we want to know if you'd be interested. We heard that you're a love coach. And I said, well, I'm not really a love coach. I'm a happiness coach. You know, I had lots of people that were in the entertainment business that wanted help with their relationships and their love life. Okay. And even though I was a happiness coach, really by trade and title, folks were thinking of me more as a relationship coach because they would call me when they were unhappy with their relationships. Okay, so interesting. Call, yeah, from the production company. They said, you want to do this show? And at first I said, no, I don't want to do any TV shows. I just want to help people. I don't want to you know, put people down. I don't want to make fun of people. I don't want to see people hurt or I don't want a lot of drama. But I ended up saying yes when they said, listen, you can just be yourself. The only point is that you're going to help people and we'll record you helping people. It's like, okay, I'm down. So it, I didn't have high expectations. It turned out to be an incredible experience. I mean, okay. So, so this is not you. And I, I, I should have looked deeper for the, some clips. I was seeking out uh, you in action on this. This was actually live, a part of the show, not a behind the scenes providing support to the actors. This was actually you on the show doing real coaching. Yeah, so there was two two seasons. I thought we were getting a third, but it didn't happen. So I was on on camera expert. And the first season, it was a therapist, Dr. Darcy, and she was the primary host. And there was a female dating coach, Laurel House, and there was a male dating coach, which was me, celebrity life coach, celebrity love coach. And uh, yeah, and then the second season, it was Dr. Darcy and I working sort of in concert, almost exclusively okay. on camera. Actually. Okay. Yeah. So I know we want to respect coach client confidentiality, <laughs> yeah. but if it was aired on national television anyway, tell us what, like, what was the craziest moment of those two seasons? If there's one thing that stood out where you were like, okay, didn't see that coming, or it really tested me as a coach. Does anything stand out as that kind of weirdest or craziest moment? Yeah, I, I would say uh, two things. Uh, one is, um, and I think we had Callum Best. He's a great guy. I love Callum Best. And he's the first to admit it, it was aired. He went missing <laughs> for a period of <laughs> maybe a day or two, totally missing, up in the Hollywood Hills, just having a blast at some parties. And he didn't show up for taping and recording. So uh, we had to postpone you know, the taping for a few days while we found Callum. <laughs> <laughs> so that funny. was unique and interesting and funny. And I would say the other thing is sort of the paranoia that sort of runs rampant on a set like that. Like you think, you know, you've got these reality stars and some of them are former athletes and some of them are former musicians or performers or other people that you've heard of, folks from the Jersey Shore. So on one hand, you know there's going to be a little bit of paranoia because those cast members don't necessarily trust the producers. Producers don't necessarily trust the cast members always. And so there's a paranoia that can develop that is sometimes real, sometimes illusory, right? Uh, that was the second thing. And the third thing I'd say, too, is I was blown away by how incredibly intelligent most of these reality stars were. I mean, okay. I was blown away. I mean, honestly, I didn't think that they would really want that much coaching, that they certainly wouldn't want therapy and group therapy at that. But it turned out. They did, and 
they were a lot more emotionally intelligent and a lot more self-aware than you might believe based on what you saw in tabloids or what you saw in a TV show. So yeah, it was pretty incredible that way. That's interesting. The thing about disappearing, so sometimes as an engineer, I wished that I could just disappear for a day, but I don't think they would be quite as forgiving at Whirlpool of just, you know, oh, you're supposed to be on the, the assembly line solving problems today and you just don't show up. Didn't always feel like a real good idea to do that. I think the consequences might've been <laughs> not worth the risk. We have that in common, brother. I mean, I talk to people all day, every day, six days a week sometimes. I've done it for 20 years and I just want to hide sometimes, right? Just totally hide. But yeah, that doesn't go over too well with the clients. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting point. So Robert, from the perspective of the work that you do, that that part of us and you know, meeting you, I wouldn't peg you as a, a shy or introverted person, which I think if I was painting with a broad brush, we might say that's the type of person who wants to escape and be alone and hide more so than, than somebody who's not. But just in general, can you describe that part of our psychology? What's going on there? Because I know as an engineer, I felt it. Now as an entrepreneur and a full-time coach, there's days when I feel it. And to your point, I've got a full lineup of clients to serve that day and I love doing it. But there's times when you have to really get your head on and your heart on and, and go anyway, right? The, the instinct that morning is, man, I wish I could just not do this. What do you think's happening there? Well, a number of things. I think it's both, on one hand, it's nature. On the other, it's nurture. Some of us are wired just differently, right? And that could be for lots of reasons. We know that there's essentially genetic coding for novelty. Some folks are more novelty seeking than other folks, right? So that in of itself. Some of us are more sensitive to stimuli, particularly external stimuli coming at us. Some of us tend to be wired a little higher or lower for introversion or extroversion. That being said, you can sometimes find that whatever wiring you have coming into the world, that it's compounded by whatever programming, conditioning, and upbringing you have as well, or it can conflict with that a little. The one thing I've discovered amongst all of this is that it's actually a lot more malleable and flexible than we might believe mm -hmm. otherwise, right? It's yeah. plastic really, because I was most shy of my high school class. Okay. And the only thing that's worse than being most shy of your high school class is being recognized and celebrated and put yeah, in your for... yearbook, right? <laughs> being most shy of your high school class. It's not good. Yeah. Put on so, a pedestal for it. Yeah. Totally. Like yeah. I mean, absolutely. And I remember getting to a place in my life where I was just so frustrated being so introverted and uncomfortable being around people. You know, I tend to find, and most introverts do, that you're energized by being alone, sort of charges your battery. And then when you're with people, can drain your battery. And extroverts work the other way. They're energized yeah. by being with people and then they feel yeah. drained when you're alone. But I found that after a period of time, because I got fed up with just being so shy and awkward, I put myself on this progressive social training program, essentially, where I tried to basically train myself to be an extrovert, or at least an ambivert. And I discovered that it can be done and you can enjoy it. It doesn't have to be painful. And so I found through that experience that we're a lot, most of us are a lot more cognitively agile and flexible yes. than we give ourselves credit for. Yes. And that's something we're exploring, I think, for most of us. I really appreciate you saying that. I agree. I have found, especially working with engineering leaders as my core client base, we love to hide behind the labels of personality profiling tools. Myers-Briggs as an example, DISC as an example. And so, oh, I'm an introvert, Robert. Therefore, this is how I will always show up in the world in these tough situations. And there's nothing I can do about it because this is my personality. And I'm with you. I've seen it. I've, I've, I'm a personal living example, same as you. I used to test as an introvert on Myers-Briggs for years. I mean, over a decade since the first time I took the tool, you know, I would retake it every couple of years for various reasons, you know, work would pay for it or you do some conference or you name it. And just last year, uh, you know what, might be two years ago now, time flies, the, the COVID effect on time. I tested as an extrovert for the first time ever. And part of that is so much attention to personal growth and development as an entrepreneur, as a coach, as a person who needs to thrive in the environment of you know, community and social interaction and relationship building, like what we're doing right now. And I just like, there it is, you know, it's absolutely possible to shift and change and not just adapt to be successful in a social setting, but to truly shift the way you create and or lose energy in, in your life. I think that's really super important. So. Well, you nailed it. And to your point, this is why growth mindset 
is such a popular yeah. theme these days and why it's so important is because we sometimes come into our lives and adulthood with these ideas of who we are that aren't based on truth or facts as much as they're based on something we've inherited or heard or tested yeah. we took somewhere along the line. And if you really want to be happy and successful, you certainly want to lean into more and more of a growth mindset. I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, all self-definition ultimately is self-limitation. When Anytime you define yourself in that way in a box, you're really limiting yourself in ways that you might not see initially, but over time you will experience more and more. And so you make a great point here, which is that I think we're all a lot bigger and better and more diverse than we probably give ourselves credit for and that we're often wanting to explore, right? So it's worth yes. exploring. Yes. Yeah. And as an engineer, precision with words matters. You know, we love to be very precise and analytical in, in vocabulary and defining and distinctions. And while that has a real positive in some aspects of the work that you do as an engineering leader, it also creates a real pattern of putting everything in its box, including yourself. Yes. And, and the vocabulary that you choose for that identity is really, really important. So let's back up. You alluded to it that you were a happiness coach and you got sucked into being a love coach for television. But before we keep pulling this thread and your expertise on it, I'd love to hear, like, where did that part of your journey begin? Because mm -hmm. you were in entertainment, you were modeling, doing acting, all these other things. And then suddenly you end up with a master's in applied positive psychology, one of the handful of people on the planet who have that designation, which is tremendous. And I'm super curious what all is included in, in that program. But w where did you stumble into or find passion to become a happiness coach in the first place? Mostly in unhappiness, mostly in depression and suicidal ideation. I mean, the truth is my first memories in life were memories of being extraordinarily stressed out, anxious, self-loathing, mm -hmm. self-judging, right? I was very judgmental and just depressed. I think at first it was just dysphoria. And so it might not qualify as clinical depression, but over time, I just assumed, look, I'm going to become a professional basketball player. That's what was my dream in life. You know, I'll become a professional basketball player. I'll make some friends. I'll have some money and things good. will all put itself out. I'll be happy. And of course that didn't happen, at least not professional basketball part. And despite doing well academically, was saluted to one of my high school class, went on to a great college. I eventually had a great management consulting job. I had friends, I had a beautiful girlfriend. I had two great German cars. I just felt more and more depressed and I began experiencing suicidal ideation dozens of times a day. I literally thought about killing myself wow. more than I thought about anything or anybody else wow. in, in the world. And so I got to a place where I decided I was going to do something about it. So I did some research and I decided I was going to slash my wrist. Um, not sure why exactly I chose that, except that I had access, I had the means and methods to do it. And the other ways felt more dramatic, I suppose. But I decided I was going to slash my wrist when you got a steak knife in the kitchen. And I remember digging into my wrist and the most unexpected, unpredictable thing happened without anything in my life, like the external conditions and circumstances of my life changing at all. So in other words, I had a great life, I had a really great life, which in some ways made me more depressed because I felt so guilty that I couldn't feel more gratitude around it all. Despite none of that changing, I dug this knife into my wrist. I felt this inexplicable peace and ineffable love and sort of seeming limitless joy that I had never experienced before. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, why am I feeling that way right now at this moment when I'm going to take my own life? So I couldn't really process it, but I thought, well, I'm going to postpone the suicide for like five or 10 minutes, you know, it wasn't very long. And at the time it felt way too ambitious. And now it's almost laughable that I couldn't wait five or 10 minutes. I, you know, at the time I thought, so in that time, I started doing a different kind of research. And that research mostly focused on happiness and unhappiness, what it is and isn't, depression. And I discovered that, first of all, I wasn't alone. And second of all, there were some people out there in the world who had solved for the very problem that I was struggling with you know, every day. So that began my journey. And along the way, eventually, at some point, I found this program at University of Pennsylvania, the Master's in Applied Positive Psychology hmm. program. Okay. My heart is like all over the place. Uh, Robert, I'm glad you're here. 
for this conversation. Um, and real quick, one of the things, I mean, there's so much here, but something that stood out to me, I wanted to get curious about, you said the first thoughts that I can remember in my life were in this category. And are you talking like, you know, young age, four, five, six, like your, your true earliest memories? Yeah. Can, can you like, tell me about, about that. I mean, I, I'm curious because I, I think about my childhood, I guess I've never really considered the emotionality or the emotional scale and spectrum of where those things are at. I more think of situations and memories and most of them being the, the positive ones and then a handful of acutely negative ones. But what, what was in your mind going on that makes that all you can remember from that young? I was a very sensitive kid and my dad would sometimes joke, oh, boy, you're afraid of your own shadow. And I was, I was, I came later to discover I was an empath, but I think lots of us are, but I would just feel lots of feelings, you know? And the first memory I have was my dad very lovingly trying to teach me to ride a bike. And I just was scared to death, first of all, for two reasons. One, I didn't want to fall off a bike and hurt myself. Second, I didn't want to fall off a bike and embarrass myself. Third of all, I didn't want to disappoint my dad, you know? Yeah. So super, yeah. right? And yeah. so, then, and I remember also at the same time playing it out and thinking, if I succeed at this, I don't fall off, and I don't disappoint my dad, I'm gonna have to do it again and again. And there's gonna be something else. Then it'll be baseball and be football. And just remember like playing it all the way out wow. and thinking, holy smokes, wow. this is going to be my whole life. My whole life is gonna be fi filled with this experience of trying so hard to accomplish or achieve or even acquire things and most of the time, many of the times, I won't be successful. And even when I am successful, I'm not going to feel fulfilled. Now, it wasn't that clear mm -hmm. linguistically, sure, even philosophically, but the idea was, this is miserable, and no matter how this turns out, I'm going to suffer. Yes, I can't win in this situation. Can't win. The, the story of my life does not compare in the sense of the suicidal tendencies and the experience you just shared. And I don't even want to begin to compare the two, but something that I do relate to was when you talked about being um, on paper, all the things that are necessary by the world's standard, the magazine cover standard of life to experience something positive, happiness, joy, success, all of these good feelings we want and not feeling it. And that that truth or that awareness of the fact that I have all the stuff but I'm still not happy, puts an even more intense downward spiral on how you relate to that. And this is one of those unspoken challenges that engineering leaders face, and I faced in my own journey, where I felt this sense of who am I to complain about anything? When I'm a, for me, white, privileged, middle-class engineer, well-paid, who lives in a great place, drives a great car, makes, you know, six figures. I have it all. And I'm whining about the fact that my life is headed towards burnout and depression. And, oh, I got divorced, you know, like whoop de doo you know, I got divorced. This is nothing. But, but for me, I was in this rock bottom, horrifically negative place. But I looked at the stats, you know, the, the what's on the resume, so to speak. And it's like, I have no business feeling this way. And that made it worse. And like, maybe what, what would be your word of encouragement, maybe for Zach's, you know, the Zach back then, what would you say to someone in that, in that place? First of all, that resonates so deeply. I get shivers, right? I mean, that's probably what pushed me over the edge was I was like, I've got a great life. I've got health and I've got a beautiful girlfriend. And I've got these friends and I've got this job and yeah, I hate the job, but is that really something to complain about? Everybody hates their job. It's like, how can I feel so miserable despite my life being so good? And so the guilt that I felt for not being able to feel that gratitude yeah. Yeah. just made it all that much worse. So the first thing I'll say is if you have everything, but you don't have happiness, you really have nothing. And if you have happiness, but you don't have anything else, you really have everything. Whew. Right? There's yeah. my chills. I, that's, that's the thing. Say it again. Just, just repeat that. That's so yeah. good. If you have everything, but you don't have happiness, you really have nothing. And if you have nothing but happiness, you really have everything. Hmm. And 
you know, all success strives for happiness. All wisdom aims for happiness. All health wants happiness. All love ultimately is after is happiness, right? And so that's why I call happiness the greatest success because it's why we want success. It's the greatest love because it's the reason we want love. It's the greatest wisdom because it's what all wisdom aims at. And so in other words, no matter what you want to achieve, accomplish or acquire, the only reason you want to achieve, accomplish or acquire it is because you think you'll feel better for having it. Yes. And if you didn't feel better or think you'd feel better for having it, it's to a large extent pointless to have, mm -hmm. right? If all of the trappings of success lead you to suicide, you really have to reconsider whether or not those trappings of success yeah. really qualify as trappings of success at all, right? Hmm. Yeah, the, so I'll use engineering speak. The, the data there is not conclusive that that's a good path to go down. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. okay. And that word guilt that you said too, really, it's like we're cut from the same, two versions of the same story. So, okay, let's get back into the journey then. You, you go through this experience, you have this moment, this glimmer of what it would be like to have nothing but happiness. And it causes you to pause, what a gift, the gift of life in that moment, and you capitalized on it. You, you found a way to get yourself to act on it. Would we call that a sense of hope, a sense of desire that pulled you? Talk to me about that phase of coming yes, into the next so chapter. I made a decision, and this is why sometimes I, I look at some of the clients and friends and family and strangers I meet, and I say, well, how could I have gotten so lucky that having been on the brink of suicide, I was able to become exponentially happier, you know, so happy that I'd say I'm just as happy as anybody I've ever met, if not happier than anybody I've ever met. So like, why is that? Like other people try just as hard, it seems, and they, but I realized something, which is that I made a commitment early on that I would either live as blissfully as humanly possible or not at all. I was very single-minded wow. in this, with this one intention, this one desire. And at that point, and I don't give myself credit for it, it was just, I was fortunate. I just saw through everything else that I had been attempting to achieve, accomplish, or acquire. And I was like, okay, I've made enough money that I've discovered it's not making me happier. In fact, lots of ways I feel more stressed out and anxious and I'm worried about quitting a job now. Relationship with the girlfriend has been amazing. It's somebody I thought I could never be with and that's making me miserable. And I've got this great health, but to what end? I'm just wasting breath here on the planet. I was able to see through all of that and come to the discovery or the recognition that if I didn't have happiness, I didn't have anything. So I made a commitment that I'm willing to surrender everything and anything and everybody and anybody in order to experience happiness. I'm going to kill myself, right? I mean, literally, it was just, it's like the desire I had was like the desire you have when somebody holds your head under water and you just want to live. You don't, nothing else matters, just that you live, that you just bob to the surface somehow, you know, you scratch and claw your way there. So the clarity was that crystal clear for me and the commitment wow. was that strong. And so as a result of that, it's interesting because it was definitely two steps forward and thousand steps back. But I started really quickly saying, okay, if everything I've been doing has led me to feel suicidal in the addiction community, we would say it differently. We'd say my best thinking led me here. <laughs> my best thinking led me to suicide and depression. Then maybe I should, and it was a very elementary way of doing it. I said, I'm just going to pull an opposite day or an opposite life with my life, which is that if the, if the corporate job is making me miserable, how can I get out of it? If the relationship though I love her so much and she loves me, is making me miserable, how can I get out of it? If the, being in cold, rainy Philadelphia makes me miserable, how can I get out of it? You know, so I started moving towards that, in that direction, in that way. It was a very clunky way of going about it. And I wasn't very informed about it. But interestingly enough, things started shifting and moving just enough that I could then see the next step and the next step and the next step. That's interesting. And now, so relate that clunky journey because what you're describing, I, I think is a, in some levels of intensity, a journey many of us are on, where it's like, okay, how can I make some change to get a better outcome? And we tend to begin with these big building blocks of our external world, the job, the home, the relationship. And yet, you know, your book title that is so adept here, 
that happiness from the inside out, not from the outside in. And so where in the journey did you come across that reality that, okay, I'm doing all these things on the outside, but at some level, then happiness becomes an inside job. Talk to us about the shift and yeah. where that came to play. So this is going to sound more sophisticated than it was for me at the time. Okay. Cause okay. I okay. Clean, up and clear up what I was really thinking. And so in the beginning, you're right. I took an outside in approach cause I didn't know any better. Right. So that outside in approach was mostly at first about doing as many things that made me happy as possible while I did as few things that made me unhappy as possible, even if it meant people yeah. would look down on me, even if it meant I'd be embarrassed, I didn't care. So over time, I discovered what I call happiness islands. Those are the activities you love for their own sake. So I just did as many of them as possible, and I would try to reverse engineer out of my life all the happiness deserts. Those are things that you do not love for their own sake. They're not intrinsically motivating or rewarding. They're only extrinsically rewarding or motivating. You do them for the results they get you. So I tried to really outsource, delegate, reduce, eliminate, automate, and regulate all the deserts in my life, okay? Beautiful. Off my plate, right? At some point, however, I realized that once I had done that, even the happiest activities, like laying on the beach. So I'd always imagine, I'm gonna to move to Miami, I'm gonna lay on the beach, I'm gonna look at models, whatever it is, great. And then you think that you're gonna be able to do that forever. And you quickly discover that three days in, three weeks in, you're like, I'm not getting the same happiness from this as I originally was. And then you go to do something else that you thought was a happy activity that you could do forever. And you're like, oh, there's no happiness here either. So I was driven deeper. So then I said, oh, maybe it's not about the happy actions or activities or things. Maybe it's about the people. So I said, oh, I just got to bring better, more interesting, fun people into the experience. Okay. And that okay. for a while. And then you start to even see through that. Like you're with the most wonderful person ever, but you still feel miserable or unhappy or anxious or stressed. And so I was like, okay, it's not the people either. And then finally I got to a place where I was like, wait, but it must have something to do with the way in which I'm thinking about the people and the beach and the world and myself that is really what's causing me to feel happy or unhappy. You can sometimes have the most positive thoughts, for instance, but still feel unhappy. And so then I realized, oh, wait, there's a deeper level here, which is not just about happy action or happy people, spending time with happy people, or even happy thoughts, we'll call it optimism of gratitude. It's also about happy no thoughts, that happiness ultimately is a state of being. It's only partly a state of mind in the beginning, but as you continue to keep that up, you discover that happiness is your true nature. It's what exists yes. underneath all of your thoughts, both positive and negative. You know, I can see the framework, right? The engineer and me coming to the surface again, like stepping down these layers to the root cause, if you want to think of it that way, but also without cause. It's not a Y equals F of X equation. And I think that's such an important thing for me and for the engineering mind that was really hard to wrap my head around because I love to formulate the understanding, the cognition, you know, the consciousness to this, then this, then this, or if I do this and do this and what is Y equals F of X, the, the transfer function to get the outcome. And I saw happiness or joy or fulfillment or you know, whatever word really resonates deeply in that situation as that outcome piece. But what I hear you saying is, I love that phrase. It's like happy, no thoughts. It's, it's when you realize it's not an outcome at all, it's actually, yeah. it's there in existence independent of any of those pieces. Am I articulating it okay or, or add to it? What would you say? It so beautifully and is a testament to the work that you've done, Zach, because that is not something to pick up easily. I mean, it took mm -hmm. me 20 years to really come around to recognizing that, right? So you nailed it. True happiness, and you're right, we can use all kinds of synonyms. It's not about the word, it's about the experience, right? Yes. So yes. true happiness is uncaused, it's unconditional. So in other words, happiness does not have a cause. Unhappiness has lots of causes. But one primary cause, which is being lost in discursive thought, right? It's being lost in obsessive compulsive thinking and over right? So that inherent, innate, intrinsic happiness or peace or love or self-love that exists within us has no cause, it's causeless, right? It's uncaused, unconditional. But we can get in the way of that by overthinking, overanalyzing. 
really, it's really powerful. So if I back up to, let's take the beach example. I live here just a mile from the Lake Michigan shores. There are beautiful beaches here. And I love, love going after work in the summer with a good book to the beach right here by my place and just sit and listen to the waves lapping the shores of Lake Michigan, take a dip, read the book, take a dip, take a nap, read the book. Like that is a happy island for me. And so if we take that experience and now relate it to the truth that you just articulated, what is happening there? Because a lot of times we'd say, well, but hey, Zach, there, there it is. You took this action, you went to the beach, you felt happy, like that's cause and effect. Would you say what's actually happening is somehow I got out of my own way to allow the experience of happening simply to manifest? Or is there something else? How would you describe yes. these cause effect mirages that we face in life? I think there's a challenge that most of us experience, which is a belief that correlation is causation. There's that, right? Well, hey, the good news is as an engineer, we understand the difference. So you can use that <laughs> yeah. language. I know, and I don't want to go too far with that because you're going to break it down for me in a way that I won't be able to understand. So there's that, first of all. But also, I would say, just to your point, you said it beautifully, happiness is a cork that floats on its own if you stay out of the way. And what we mostly do all day, every day, is just get in the way of it. That's it. So we're just yeah. holding the cork yeah. down in the water and saying, why is the cork floating? Why is the cork floating? Why is the cork floating? And so we work so hard at the happiness thing. When really all we need to do is not force the cork to float, but just take our hand off the cork so it floats on its own. Same deal with us. So when we see a beautiful sunset, and another way of saying it is this, lots of things can encourage you to be happy, but nothing can make you happy mm. because happiness is not only within you, it's what you essentially are, right? It's your true nature. So it's just really about getting out of the way. It's the simplest way to put it. And the only thing that really gets in the way is our coming up with reasons for why we shouldn't be happy, why we aren't happy, what everybody else is doing wrong, you know, blame and judgment ultimately comes down really to judgment. Um, we can talk about that in terms of duality. And anytime you start to think, you can start to see the ways in which the mind is, oh, the mind is divisive. It's never decisive, right? It's always divisive. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Right. So things in duality, to have a thought is to be or exist in this world of duality where you've got a pro to con immediately. So as you say, this sunset is beautiful. And then immediately it's like relative to what? Something that, that must not be beautiful. You know, I feel pleasure yes. to what? The pain. So yes, as long as you mostly see and experience the world through your own thoughts and concepts and labels and definitions and descriptions, mm -hmm. instead of having a direct experience of everything, right? So in other words, perceiving and experiencing without interpretation all the time, you'll believe that happiness is something that exists external to you that has causes, or you might even believe it's something that's internal to you that you have to produce or manufacture over and over and over again. And that's extraordinarily effortful and time and energy consuming and exhausting. Whew. I love this entire train of thought. And it's almost ironic to use that phrase, you know, thought, because the whole thing <laughs> we're seeking to get to here is the no thought side of this. And engineering as a discipline, you know, I paint with the broad brush. I, I'm sure there are exceptions, but my experience as an engineer consistently has been leverage the power of my intellect and thinking to create the results that matter. And you get trained and taught that if you don't have what you want, get smarter, work harder, keep learning. And so this is a really difficult message to hear for that part of my psyche, even though I've done the work and I'm already in some ways so much further along the journey, I still sense rebellion in my mind. Like this can't really be the thing because if I can't think about it and articulate it and put a label on it, it can't be real. Oh, and, exactly. Ugh, talk to me. Yeah. So what an eloquent, poignant remark to make. All of nature is blissful except for human beings. All of nature, <laughs> right? I mean, just think about that for a moment, right? <sighs> I mean, all of nature experiences the same loss, accidents, misfortune, illness, death, as we do as human beings, but only people make a problem out of their own existence. And I love the prefrontal cortex, right? And I love thinking it's fun, it can be enjoyable, it's entertaining, and we accomplish a lot of things that way. And we also accomplish a lot of suffering and depression and anxiety yes. and that way as well, yes. right? It's tough to know and feel and think that 
you can actually experience more happiness by not knowing so much. As Mark Twain would say, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so. Oof. Yeah. And that's why babies and small animals are so much happier than adults. That's beautiful. Okay. In the spirit of where do we go with this reality as a first step? And knowing that I almost don't know how to articulate a question that doesn't imply doing cause and effect kinds of ideas into our minds, but as much as possible, this being and doing duality of our nature. And what would you encourage someone if you were coaching me in this world and I was really struggling with overanalyzing, you know, taking my thought life into these negative spaces and holding that cork underwater, where does someone begin? If there's a, a first step or something that we can start to experiment or practice in our lives to get a little closer to this nature of happiness, what yeah. would you give me? Yeah. So I would start, if you're new to this journey or you're really struggling with your happiness or unhappiness, I would start with an outside in approach. And there's nothing to be ashamed about that. Start with the low hanging fruit. Yes. I would identify my happiness islands and my happiness deserts. And I would do everything humanly possible to schedule into my life more of the islands and to schedule out of my life more of the deserts, right? By outsourcing, delegating, reducing, limiting, automating, regulating. Okay, first step. Number two, I would do the same thing with people. So people that supported my happiness, I would spend more time with. People that did not support my happiness, I would spend less time with. Very simple. Then I would move on to step three. And I would start to tell better feeling stories based in truth about everything and everyone in my life, including myself, right? So that could be called positive thinking, although I think that gets a bad rap. I sometimes like to call it constructive thinking. It's just thinking and talking to yourself and others in ways that support you feeling what you most want to feel, experiencing what you most want to experience, or achieving what you most want to achieve, right? So it's like, is this thought supporting me and getting a promotion? Is this thought supporting me and feeling happier? That simple, okay? So you want to practice that and practice that and practice that until it becomes a habit. It only takes about 22 to 66 days if you do it every day, if you're really consistent with it, but most people struggle with doing it yeah, every day. Yeah, yeah. Can we, maybe I'll, I'll call it like go Tim Ferriss on this for just a second. When you talk about that storytelling step three, I think most people can wrap their head around schedule in the happiness islands get clear and okay maybe we should back up do the work right like i need to go home actually figure out what those things are make it happen make it a priority figure out what the deserts are take the actions make it a, a non-negotiable to go do it but the step three one sometimes can trip up the engineering mind i know from myself and my own journey and the clients i support okay robert what do you mean tell better stories is this sitting down with a journal writing things down is this meditating you know visualizing is this working with a coach talking it out like what are you actually seeing happen yeah. in that step three lots of options there i'd say you want to focus on the challenges that are most difficult when you feel in a neutral or positive mood so if you're struggling with something a whole lot like your family or something and you know like trying to reframe that or you're bankrupt or you just lost your job and you're just suffering. You don't really want to start there. You want to start with something that's easier. But the idea is that you want to, first of all, just notice the themes that do seem to reoccur in your life. The things that you seem to struggle with the most, that seem to bring you the most unhappiness or experiences of failure or stress or anxiety. And yes, you can sit down. It's probably the best way. Sit down. And when you're in a neutral emotional state or higher, because if you're less than that, you're going to do a good job with this. You just want to sit down and you want to say, okay, how can I see this in a way that's true, but better feeling? So a simple example is, let's say you're broke, right? So I've been there plenty of times, totally broke, like no money, right? And I would just say, I'm broke. You know, gosh, I'm a failure. I can't believe I've gotten here. Okay, maybe true. Okay. Also, just as true, but a lot more constructive and supportive and better feeling is to say, there's only up from here. There's only up from here. I really can't yeah. go, right? There's only up from yeah. here. So the question is just, it's using language, and we sometimes think of, of language as a way to describe our experience, and that's true, but language doesn't just describe your experience, it informs your experience, Yes. And then it steers it, right? You want to play with language a little. So it might be a good example is in the beginning when I started this work, I didn't realize I was doing it, but I was saying, we have more unhappy people on the planet than we have ever in the history of humankind. True. And then I was like, that's not a very 
constructive, better feeling way of telling the story. And so I reframed it and said, oh, we have never had as great an opportunity for happiness as we do in this day and age, mm, right? Beautiful. That's beautiful. True. Better. That's really good. And the broke example, one of the things that stands out for me in that specific one is the story to say, I'm broke. But so was Tony Robbins at one time, who's now a billionaire and one of the most influential people on the planet. I'm broke, but so was, anyway, there's a thousand more names we would all know that you could put in that category. And and I like using that as another way to amplify a story um, as well, just to say, I'm not alone in being in this place. That, that's so good. I love that so much. And you're right, the key here, and you wanna be careful of this and not make the mistake I did in the beginning, which was pasting smiley stickers on empty gas tanks kind of thing, <laughs> right? Where you just say the right word, but on the inside, you still feel empty. You know, oh, it's that's like, funny. That's right? Funny. So, so the, you're betting for a shift emotionally. And at first, just don't reach so high. Just look for a little shift. If you're feeling yes. depressed, just look for frustration. If you're looking, if you're in frustration, just look for a little bit of annoyance. If you're in annoyance, then you can begin to look for a little bit of peace. And you want to move your way up the emotional scale, but just piece by piece. You don't have to do it all, all at once. The other thing, it's a cheat code. So if you really struggle with this, and lots of people struggle with this, I feel like I'm being inauthentic. I can't tell the better feeling story. It just feels fake. Fine. If you just stick to the facts without adding any additional storytelling or meaning making around it, that also works. So instead of saying I'm broke, that's a judgment. I have zero dollars in my bank account. Okay, and a story. Any right. additional thought on top of that, probably just storytelling, meaning making, and judgment. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I talk a lot about with my clients, separating what happened from the story about what happened. You know, my boss is a jerk. That never happened. Your boss said something to you. He used these words. That's what happened. Your boss being a jerk is your story about that situation. You know, so that's really, really good. Oof. Okay. We could go all day, Robert. I Maybe do this for me. And, and you used some words before we hit record today. Maybe that's where, but if you were going to summarize the message here about happiness, what's the bottom line? No matter what you want, you really want happiness. Prioritize happiness above everything else because happiness is the greatest success and it also leads to success empirically, scientifically. We know that we've got decades of, of research to support that. Happiness is presence ultimately. And presence is less about thinking and more about not thinking. Hmm. I'm going to be hitting the back 30 seconds button on my <laughs> podcast player to listen to those words over and over and over. I, I love that so much. Robert, if someone is resonating with this work, wants to connect with you, grab your book, follow your amazing content, maybe reach out to you for coaching, where can people find you and get more of Robert Mack? Yeah. Uh, you can find me at my website at coachrobmackmack.com. You can find me on most all social media platforms, probably most consistently Instagram at Rob Mac Official. And you can find both of my release books, Love from the Inside Out and Happiness from the Inside Out, everywhere great books are sold, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, all the places. Beautiful. Robert, I always end with the same question. And it's rooted in the truth that you know as well as anybody I've ever interviewed that questions lead, answers follow. And if we want better answers in our lives, we want to make sure we're asking better questions. And so many of us are seeking happiness as the answer. So what would be the question that you would lead us with today? What am I? Ooh. What am I? Right? I have a mind, but am I a mind? I have a body, but am I a body? I have a personality, but am I a personality? What is it that's aware of the mind and the body and the personality and the possessions and the achievements, but not it, right? So what am I really? Whew. I love that. Thank you so much. What am I? Not who, what am I? Robert, I would just want to say and acknowledge you. This has been one of the most powerful conversations I've had on the podcast in a long time. The work that you do, preparing for this, it's so obvious you're having a massive impact in the world. I love that 
that reframe you gave about now is a time where happiness has a greater opportunity than it's ever had. You know, the Happy Engineer podcast has been blessed by your generosity today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been awesome. Your pleasure. Honestly, Zach is all mine. I feel so uplifted. I feel so touched and honored and humbled that you would have me in conversation. Clearly, brother, you have done the work yourself over and over and over again. So thank you for that. Thank you for blessing me and all of us with your phenomenal work. Hello, my friend, Zach White here again, and I wanted to let you know that's all we've got for this episode of the Happy Engineer Podcast. Thank you so much for investing your time with me today. It is an absolute pleasure to be able to bring you this content. Just as a reminder, it would be amazing if you would subscribe and share this episode with any other engineers you know who may benefit from this. And if you're like me, I hope that you'll take some notes and more importantly, take action. In our audio version of the podcast on Apple Podcasts and any place that you go to find podcasts, there's a little more content from me about this episode in the debrief. If you really want to hear about how to put this into action, I'd encourage you to go grab that. But thank you for joining us for the video version of our interview today. And again, can't thank you enough for helping us to get the word out about the Happy Engineer podcast and what we're doing. If there's any way we can serve you, would love to do that. Go find us at oasisofcourage.com or reach out to me on social media at Oasis of Courage. And don't forget again to subscribe and click the bell to have notifications of upcoming releases of new episodes of the podcast. As always, I want to leave you with this. If you stay in your comfort zone, you're not going to grow. So let's crush comfort, create courage, and let's do this.